Let's see, can I stop the recording and then restart? No, I'll just edit that out. Okay, here we go again. Uh, welcome to the physics class for January the 14th. I'm sure you're very curious to know what's the uh, what's happening with the test. Uh, the answer is that I have not had a chance to look through all of the um, submissions that you guys sent in to try and get partial credit. I will I will do that over the next several days. Don't be surprised if it uh, if I don't post the grades until maybe Sunday night. It's going to be a busy weekend for me. Uh, if uh, this test goes uh, the way that previous tests have gone, then uh, your those of you that submitted partial credit, uh, your uh, your final grade will probably be quite a bit higher than the raw score that you've got right now. Uh, so just be patient on that one. And <clears throat> let's see what else. Okay, so we the, we're going to do an activity today. We're going to do a lab activity, and then your homework will be to write up a lab report. And the lab report will go on next term's grade, not this term's grade. The test will definitely go on this term's grade. And other than that, I can't think of anything to uh, say. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right in to the new material. Uh, we're, like I said, we're gonna do a lab today and this lab is a good introduction to the, uh, the second half of the year. The, the way that I do things in physics, the first half of the year and the second half of the year are quite distinctly different. Let me open up a whiteboard and just so I can write a few things on here. There's a couple terms that you guys need to know. So one term is, Classical mechanics. That is what we have been doing all year long. Now, mechanics, it, that word means uh, motion. Uh, some of you may know that a mechanical engineer is a person who worries about things that move, you know, cars and robots and clocks and things like that. Those are things that a mechanical engineer works with. An electrical engineer obviously works with things that use electricity, chemical engineers work with things that work, do uh, chemistry. Mechanical engineers do things with motion. And so everything that we've done up until now has dealt with motion. You know, you got a car driving down the road, you analyze the forces that are acting on it, decide whether it's gonna be accelerating or decelerating and all those, all those fun things. Okay, the second half of the year, starting today, we will be dealing with something called wave mechanics. Okay, and wave mechanics, there are several subcategories to that. Now, when most people think of waves, they think of like ocean waves or lake, lake waves, okay? Uh, and those certainly are a valid form of waves, but there are so many other kinds of waves. In fact, can you guys uh, mention a couple? What, what are some things that, uh, that you know exist in the world around us that are actually waves. Go ahead and either type it in the chat box or unmute yourself and say it out there out loud. Okay, light waves. Okay, uh, sound. Um, electrical power, yeah. Uh, AC power. Okay, heat waves. Oh, I can't type quickly here. Um, electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> uh, microwaves, okay. Have I got all of the ones that you put in there? Okay, very good. Yes, those are all different types of waves and those are all things that we will be studying over the course of the, the rest of the year. Um, and there's another type of thing that uh, most people don't realize are waves, at least not until you've taken a, an advanced physics class. And some people consider it to be a separate category. Now, I personally consider it to be a subset of wave mechanics, but it, you, I'm sure you've heard of quantum mechanics. In fact, let me, let me give it a separate category. So, so quantum mechanics 
deals with the motion of things that are super, super small, like for instance, atoms. Uh, now, when you uh, took a science class in uh, junior high school, I, uh, I suspect that uh, your, your science teacher probably told you that atoms are kind of like little solar systems. Uh, in fact, let's look at the hydrogen atom. That's the simplest one. So we've got this uh, proton in the middle and here's an electron, which is a lot smaller. And the electron kind of goes around the proton very much the way that a planet goes around the sun. Uh, so that's the way that it's usually presented to people in junior high school and in, in, even in high school, actually. Uh, when you, if, you t if you're taking Ms. Coach Miller's chemistry class, he may have uh, presented it to you like this. Now, if it's, if it's not a hydrogen atom, if it's uh, you know, one of the others, then there's going to be more protons and more electrons. But let's stick with hydrogen because it's simplest. I hope <clears throat> that your junior high school teacher told you that this is actually a lie. Now, it's a useful lie. Um, it, it, does, it can be used to explain a lot of phenomena, but it's not the complete picture. That electron is not like a little marble going around a bigger marble. That electron is actually a wave. Okay, so as it goes around, it goes around as a wave. And for, for that matter, the proton is also actually a wave. Uh, so if you get down to the most basic, at least most basic as, so, as far as we know right now, uh, you find out that the matter that makes up your body is actually waves. So there is a whole lot that we need to understand um, about waves in order to understand the world around us. So today we're gonna to start into the study of waves. We're going to do it by doing a lab, which at, when I describe it to you, you're gonna say, well, is that really waves or is that, I mean, that looks to me like that's just more classical mechanics. Well, it's a perfect transition from classical mechanics into wave mechanics. So what I'm going to have you guys do is look around your house. I'm going to have you, you're going to get some string. You're going to get some object and you're going to make a pendulum. And then what we're going to do is we're going to study the, the motion of the pendulum and see what affects the, the pendulum's behavior. Uh, now we're going to do it at home. It's getting a little twist there. The way you're going to do it at home is going to be a little different from the way that I normally do it. Um, what, if we were meeting face to face, what I would do is I would break you up into groups. And I would say, uh, I would have each one of you study different aspects of a pendulum. Um, and let's, so probably a good thing to do right now is let's think about the different aspects of a pendulum and what we might want to study. So what I'm gonna have you do today is experiments or at least an experiment where you're going to vary certain aspects of the pendulum. And in every case, the dependent variable is going to be the period of the pendulum. So you're gonna change other things about the pendulum and see how that affects the period of the pendulum. Now we should start off by making sure everybody understands what I mean when I say period of the pendulum. Now we ha I have used that word before. We have, we have talked about it before and done problems with it before when we were talking about planets going around the sun or moons going around a planet. Can somebody just unmute them themselves and remind us what does the word period mean in this context? Isn't it? When a wave reaches like the same point again. So okay. like when a wave completes its uh, movement. Okay, very good, a wave or an object. Okay, so the, what we talked about before, we said, we said, okay, here's the sun and here's some planet, the planet's going around the sun. So we start the clock when the planet is in some position and then we let the clock run as it goes around. And then when it comes back to the starting point, that's when we stop the clock and that is the period, that amount of time is the period. So we're gonna do the same thing with uh, the pendulum here. So if we start the clock when it's right here and we let it swing over the other side, 
So one, one complete uh, movement from here to here, is that the pendulum or is that the period? Hopefully you guys are all gonna say, no, that's only half the period, okay? In order to be the period, it has to go from here over to the other side and then back to the starting point. So that amount of time is the period. All right, so that's gonna be the dependent variable. Uh, what I'd like you guys to do right now is uh, suggest certain characteristics of the pendulum that we could play with that might possibly affect the period. And so, in fact, let me just make a list real, real quick here. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, I want you to give me various things that we might want to study that where these various things could be the independent variable but the dependent variable is always going to be the period of the pendulum. Okay, so I see people typing in the chat box. Okay, so the length of the string. Okay, so that certainly might affect the period of the pendulum. What else might affect the period of the pendulum? Okay, the, the weight of the object. Let me, let me rephrase that and let me say the mass of the object. Uh, although weight of the object works too. Um, okay, keep coming. Okay, the angle. Okay, so let's call that the starting angle. Okay, any others? Ah, okay, interesting. Derek thinks that the planet we're on might possibly affect it, and he's right. Okay, so let, let me put that down as the gravity. Okay, so the strength of the gravity. So if I have a pendulum, and it has a certain period. I take that exact same pendulum with the same length, same mass, same starting angle, everything, but I go to a different planet where the strength of gravity is different. Yeah, it's very possible that that might affect the period of the pendulum. Um, okay, any others? I think you've captured the main ones there. Okay, all right, so all of those are possible things that in theory, conceivably could affect the period of the pendulum. So if this was a normal year, what I would do right now is I would break you up into groups and I'd say, okay, everybody in this group here, for I want you to spend the next 10 minutes doing experiments where you're gonna change the mass. You're gonna keep everything else the same because you guys, you guys know that when you're doing experiments where you have different variables, you got to be very careful to only change one of them at a time because if you change more than one at a time, then it's, it's almost impossible to figure out what's going on. Okay, so I'd say one to one group, I'd say, okay, so you guys, you're going to you're going to change the mass of the object. Make sure you keep the length the same. Make sure you always start from the same angle. And to keep Derek happy, make sure you always do it on the same planet. Okay, uh, and then I would, I would pick another group and I say, okay, now for you guys, your, uh, your variable is the length of the string. So keep the mass the same, keep the starting angle the same, only play with the string. And then somebody else, their variable would be, would be the starting angle. So mass of the planet, that one's gonna be a little bit hard to do with. So we'll just kind of ignore that one. Uh, so then in a normal year, after you guys have had 10 or 15 minutes to play with those, I would have you come back and report your results. Anybody want to take a guess as to what the results would be? So let, let me open up my whiteboard again. And let's hold off on, on the length. Let's, I want to come back to that one later. Let's think about mass. All right, so I'd like everybody to type into the chat box. I want you to make a hypothesis uh, and type it in the chat box in a private message. I don't want it to be a public message. What do you think about the mass? Uh, so now remember the very first day of class where we did experiments like this, and there were two questions that I wanted you to answer. I wanted you to answer, do you expect that there would be a direct relationship or an inverse relationship? Do you expect that it would be linear or nonlinear? And so I'm going to ask you those exact same questions right now. If our independent variable is the mass and our dependent variable is the period, would you expect direct or inverse would you expect linear or nonlinear? And if you don't know, just, just take a wild guess. And in fact, I, I doubt if, if very many, if any of you will be able to make an educated guess. So just go ahead and make a guess. Come on guys. Okay, now I'm starting to see some. 
Okay. Okay. All right, so now I'm seeing lots of answers. And it looks like about half of you are saying direct, half of you are saying inverse. Um, kind of the same thing with linear and nonlinear, roughly half one way or the other, except for Ethan. Okay, Ethan typed in, he said, I would expect no change at all. Mass is irrelevant for the period. Ethan, could you unmute yourself and tell us why did you say that? Uh, because in a frictionless environment, all the energy, uh, all the potential energy, the converting, I can't talk. When it goes down, it'll go up with the exact same energy in the exact same way. So there's no loss, there's no change because the mass isn't changing at any point. Okay. That's a good way to say it. All right. Okay. I like that. Um, there was one other person who also said the same thing, and that was Crew. Crew, what was your logic for saying that? You're muted, Crew. Okay. I'm so sorry. Something was just going on a second ago. Could you repeat what you were asking? Why, why did you say that you didn't expect there to be any correlation? Um, because uh, I think like, uh, the, like how potential energy and kinetic energy works. Okay, so I very, think that changing the mass wouldn't change. Like, okay. so your argument is basically the same as Ethan's argument. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, oh, there was one other one as well. And AJ, why, why did you think it? Uh, pretty much the same thing as them. Like, changing the weight wouldn't change it because gravity pulls uh, heavier objects and lighter objects at the same speed. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, I, I, I like what all of you guys said, but I want to focus in on what AJ just said. Uh, you guys remember when we were talking before about if you take two objects and you let them drop, uh, you know, will they fall at the same rate? And there was a famous scientist, you know, Galileo, who according to the story that you may have heard as an elementary school student, he supposedly went up on the Leaning Tower of Pisa and he took two objects, a small, a small rock and then a bigger object, a bigger rock in this case, they're not rocks, but small object, big object, and they, he dropped them. And now everybody just assumed that the bigger rock would fall faster, right? Because if you do it with, with paper, okay, uh, you got a rock and a piece of paper, the rock falls faster than the paper. So everybody assumed it'd be the same thing with the little rock and big rock. Nobody even ever bothered to even test it. And so according to the story, he went to the Leaning Tower of Pizza and tested it there and found out that they both fell at the same rate. Now, historians say he probably didn't, didn't actually do it at the Leaning Tower of Pizza, but he did do it. Uh, and he did find out that they do fall at the same rate. And so AJ is saying that the same thing is probably going to happen with a pendulum. So if I've got a pendulum where the, the mass here is a fairly large mass, okay, it's going to fall at the same rate that a pendulum with a lower mass would fall and, and your thinking is exactly right. And so in a normal year, when the students break up into groups and then come back and report the results, what they, what they find is that changing the mass does not affect the period of the pendulum. Now you do have to be careful because if you do go to extremes, you will have a problem. So when you guys do the lab today, I'm expecting that you're just gonna take regular old lightweight string and you're gonna have a fairly heavy object so that you don't need to worry about air resistance because remember, if you drop a piece of paper, a piece of paper does fall more slowly. So make sure that the object has enough mass so that it overcomes air resistance and make sure that the string is a fairly lightweight string. You might be tempted to get a piece of rope and so here, what I've done is my, my mass here is a cork, which is extremely lightweight. And so my rope actually has more mass than the object that's tied at the end of the rope. And so if I were to do experiments with this, my experiments would not turn out well at all. Okay, so don't use rope and make sure that the object at the end is, is heavy enough that it, that is way heavier than, than whatever is the string that you're using and heavy enough that you don't have to deal with air resistance. And if that's the case, then you'll find out that the mass doesn't matter. 
Okay, also the starting angle is going to be really interesting here. So let me open up my whiteboard again. Okay, so the people who do the uh, study with the starting angle, the results that they report back are very interesting. What they find is that as long as the angle is quote unquote small, and we need to define what that means, but if angle is small, then there is no noticeable difference as they change the starting angle. Okay, now notice I said noticeable because it turns out if you study it really, really, really carefully, um, the starting angle actually does have an effect, but as long as theta is small, the effect is so small that it's hard to notice. So how small is small? Well, it turns out that if small, if the angle is, oh, let's say less than 15 degrees, then the effect on the period that you'll notice is like maybe one or 2%. Uh, it's just really, really small. Now, if you get up to where it's like 20 degrees or 30 degrees, then you start to see a difference in the angle. But as long as it's less than 15 degrees, then they weren't able to measure any distance, any difference in the uh, period as a function of the starting angle. Okay, so gravity, uh, well, we don't really have a way of varying the gravity, so we won't worry about that one. Okay, so length turns out to be the biggie. Uh, and that is in fact what I'm gonna have you guys do. So part two of the, of the lab in a normal year uh, is that I say, okay, now that we have a better idea of which variables we wanna focus on, we know that length is really the biggie. And so what you guys are gonna do if you're homework tonight is you're going to vary the length and see how that affects the period. So keep the mass the same, not because it's super important, but just because it's easier to view it that way. And then as long as the starting angle is less than about 15 degrees, don't spend a lot of time fixating on that. Don't worry about, oh, I did it at 15 degrees this time and I only did it at 13 degrees the other time. Oh, is that gonna mess up my results? No, it's not. So you can just eyeball it. You know, just keep it relatively small, just eyeball it and you should be fine. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to start off at a length of about 10 centimeters. And by the way, we're gonna be working in meters. So 10 centimeters is 0.1 meters. Uh, and so find out what the period is then, and then take it down to 20 centimeters and try it again, and then go to 30 centimeters and 40 and 50. And I'd like you to go in approximately that, that, uh, that step size, all the way from 10, from 10 centimeters up to one full meter. Uh, and now when, when you measure it, okay, you might not have a measuring tool that has both inches and centimeters on it. Uh, you might have to do a conversion. So hopefully you guys know that 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch, All right? So if you have to measure it in inches, okay, go ahead and do it, but then convert it into meters, not centimeters, by the way, I want it in meters, All right? And so then we're going to find out uh, the answer to the questions. Now, the first one we can do really easy. You know, the first question is whether it's direct or inverse. We can answer that one right now, really quick. Okay, so here goes where this ring is short. Okay, so get a look at that. Okay, now let's do it where the string is long. Okay, so what do you think, direct or inverse? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. When the string is short, motion looks like this. String is long, motion looks like this. Okay, oh my goodness. Oh, people. Uh, okay, what does it mean to be direct and what does it does mean to be inverse? Apparently, we need to do a little review on that. Okay, so a direct relationship means as the independent variable gets bigger, the dependent variable also gets bigger. Inverse means as the direct, as the independent variable gets bigger, the, in, the dependent gets smaller. Okay, so right now, my independent variable is really small, okay? And the amount of time that it takes to go from here and back is very small. Okay, length gets bigger, time gets bigger. That is a direct relationship, people. That's not an inverse relationship, that's direct. Okay, now, next question, linear or nonlinear. Well, 
That's for you to figure out. Okay, is it gonna be linear? Or gonna, is it gonna be nonlinear? Now, I just got through telling you that it's for you to figure out, but maybe I should maybe I should tell you a little bit. You are going to find out that it's going to be nonlinear. The question is, what kind of nonlinear relationship is it going to be? That is the your job today. So uh, you're going to have to figure out what equation fits the uh, the relationship. And and I'll tell you right now, it's going to be nonlinear. So what are some nonlinear functions that you guys know? Well, you know, quadratics, cubics, quartics, um, you know, uh, square root functions, you know, and depending on what math class you're, you're in, you may or may not know that there's also logarithmic functions, there's exponential functions, there's a whole bunch to choose from. So your job today is going to be to figure that out. Okay. Um, now, let's talk through a couple important details that you're going to that I, I want to make sure you, you know. One is just experimental technique in general. When you measure the period, if you measure it wrong, you're going to run into some big problems because of your experimental technique. Okay, let's suppose that your, uh, your little sister is helping you out. So, uh, so you're going to be working the, uh, the pendulum and your little sister is going to get out her smartphone. And so when you tell her go, she's going to push the button. And when you tell her stop, she's going to push it again. So let's, let's do the experiment the way that I have seen students try to do it. I shake my head when I see it, but I, I see it. Okay, so let's suppose that you are my little sister. So you are Sally. All right, so I'm going to say, okay, get ready, Sally. Okay, ready, set, go, stop. All right, so what do you think? If you're Sally, are you going to be able to give me good results? If, you know, if I say, get ready, on your mark, and set, go, stop. Am I going to get reliable results if I do the experiment that way? What do you guys think? Somebody unmute yourself and tell me. Let me give you a hint. The answer is you're not going to get reliable results. Why? Somebody unmute yourself and tell me why are we not going to get re reliable results using that technique? Because we have bad reaction times. Because we have bad reaction times. The human reaction time. Um, some years what I've done is I've actually done experiments where students measure what their reaction time is for hitting a button. And uh, it's about you know, 0.2 seconds. So, so there's gonna be some uncertainty of about 0.2 seconds. That's what's typical for a teenager. And so if the, if the period that I'm trying to measure is less than one second, and I've got an uncertainty due to my human measurement reaction time of 0.2 seconds, my uncertainty is, is a large fraction of the thing that I'm trying to measure, and I'm not going to get reliable results. Hmm, if only there was some way to solve this problem. Any suggestions? What could we do to get around the human reaction time problem? Hmm, come on. Crew, you were the one that, oh, okay, okay, good. Okay, Zane is suggesting don't use humans. <laughs> and, and you are correct. There are tools, which I do have in the lab, that would do the measurement for you. So it takes out the human, takes the human out of the equation. And that is a good way to do it. But it turns out there's a simpler way. Yeah, AJ, you got it. Okay, so AJ is saying take an average, all right? So let's try it again. So let's pretend that you are my little sister. So you're Sally. So this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it swing several times. So I'm gonna say, okay, Sally, get ready. On your mark, get set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, get ready, stop. Okay, so I let it swing 10 times. And so obviously whatever time Sally measures there, I'm gonna take it and divide it by 10. But the neat thing is that the human reaction time also gets divided by 10. Okay, so by doing it that way, you will get reliable results. Okay, so make sure that you do that. And so I recommend 10 swings. Um, I mean, if you wanted to do five, well, okay, but you get, you know, if you do 10, you get better results. Okay, so that is definitely going to help you get uh, results. Okay, so now what you're going to do then is you're going to graph your results. And so let's open up a whiteboard. 
and see. All right, so your independent variable is the length of the string. Oh, and by the way, that reminds me, something I should tell you that's really important, okay? I call it the length of the string. I probably shouldn't call it that because there's, there's a, it's, there, it's a better, uh, well, what's really important is the distance from the pivot point to the center of mass of the object. That is the distance that you want, not the string, but the string plus a little bit more. So the distance from the pivot point to the center of the object, that is the length that you need to put in there. Okay, um, and so let's go back in here. Okay, so that's your independent variable. Your dependent variable is going to be the period. Okay, now I've already told you that it will not be linear. So there's a couple possibilities. You know, maybe it's going to look like this where it curves upwards. Maybe it's gonna look like this where it goes upwards. Okay, but uh, you know, the, it starts off steep, but gets shallower as it goes, or maybe it starts off shallow and gets deeper as it goes. Um, you know, it's gonna be something like that. So your job is going to be to come up with an equation that matches that data. Hmm, if only your math teachers had told you how to do that. Well, I think they have. Anybody remember? Does the term regression ring a bell? Has your math teacher told you how to do regressions using Desmos or doing your calculator? You don't need Desmos. Your if you've got a graphing calculator, you can do it. But Desmos is easier. Um, OK, so some people are saying that uh, they don't remember hearing that from their math teacher. Well, OK. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and teach you a little bit of math here. Um, it's not that hard. I mean, if you use Desmos, Desmos is the greatest thing. I just, I love the Desmos people. Uh, okay, so let's open up a uh, page here and let's go to Desmos. So you'll now watch, you'll see when I type D, my, my browser knows I want Desmos because <laughs> I use Desmos so much. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let's go in there. And we are going to want the graphing calculator. Okay. Uh, all right. So now we need to put the data in that we want to graph. Now I'm no, I know your your math teacher is told you how to do this, but just in case, I uh, let me show you. Okay. So I'm going to click on the plus sign. I've got a choice of various things that I could add. What I want to add is going to be a table, and so the default is x1, y1. All right, and so X is our independent variable, which is gonna be the length. So what I want you guys to do is do something where you start at about 0.1 meters and then 0.2 meters. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly 0.1. You know, if it turns out to be 0 0.09 or if it turns out to be one, uh, you know, 0.11, that's okay. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly this, but uh, okay, so let's go to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, and I want you to go all the way to one meter, but uh, tell you what, I'm gonna, just, just to keep things a little bit simpler and briefer, I'm gonna stop here, but I want you to go all the way to one meter, please. All right, so now's when we put in the numbers that you measure. So let me just make up some numbers off the top of my head. You will actually put in measure numbers. So let's suppose that when the, when the length is 0.1, our period weren't, turns out to be about uh, 0 0.9 seconds. And then here at 0.2, it turns out to be about 4.1 seconds. And then here it goes to be about 8.2 uh, seconds. And then here it goes, oh, let's say 15 seconds. And here it goes to about uh, 26 seconds. And here it's at about 35 seconds. And here it's at about 51 seconds. Okay. All right. So there's our data. Now, you may have noticed that while I did that, Desmos tried to graph everything, but I only see the first two data points. So I want to see everything. So I, I could play with the uh, scale on my thing here, but hopefully you guys know that Desmos has a built-in feature that's really nice. Over here, you, whoops, okay, here. You see this uh, thing that looks like a magnifying glass here? And then I hover over it and it says zoom fit. Hmm, I wonder what would happen if I click that. Oh my goodness, look at that, isn't that neat? 
Okay, Desmos automatically sets the window for me. All right, okay, good. So there is a graph and it's nonlinear and it's the kind that starts off shallow and then it gets steeper as it goes along. So I need to figure out what equation do I think is going to model that the best. So again, I want you guys to type in the chat box. What kind of equations do you guys know that this might possibly be? Type them into the chat box, guys. All right, so I'm seeing quadratic, I'm seeing exponential. Um, I'm seeing a function where somebody just typed in the function um, and uh, that's referred to as a power function. Um, okay, all right, so we got various choices here to choose from, all right? So now here is the thing that I would hope that your math teacher has already shown you. I think when I show you this, I hope you're gonna say, oh yeah, I remember that, I just forgot. Okay, so let's start off by seeing if it fits a straight line. Now we already know it's not linear, but let, yeah, just for fun here, let's, let's try fitting it to a straight line and see what happens. Okay, so again, I'm gonna come over to the plus sign. I'm gonna click that. This time I'm gonna choose an expression. Now, one way that I could do it is I could take a stab at what I think the line is. So I could say y equals, so mx plus b. So let's say, oh, the slope maybe is about, uh, I don't know, 25. So 25 times x, let me stop right there. Okay, so that's my guess for a line that fits it. And you can see, oh, that's not a very good guess. Okay, so instead of 25, let's try 40. Okay, yeah, okay, a little bit better. Okay, let's try 50. So I could just keep on going by guess and check here, but Desmos has a better way to do it. Desmos will tell me what is the line that fits it the best. So what I need to do is I need to come over here. Oops. Um, okay, so instead of saying y equals, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say y1, because y1, those are the data points that Desmos already knows. And instead of saying equals, I'm gonna use that squiggle sign. Now on my, on my keyboard, I have a little squiggle sign on the, on the keyboard. You might not have that. So if you come down to the Desmos keyboard and you look over here, you still don't see it. But if you come to the ABC, there it is right there. That is the squiggle sign, okay? So now I make my keyboard go away. So when Desmos sees that, what it knows is that I want it to tell me what is the M value that fits it. So I'm gonna say M and then times X, but not just any old X, I want it to be X1. I want the data that I've published. Okay, so there you go. So Desmos is saying that, that if I insist on using this equation, then the, the value that fits it the best would be if M is equal to 59 point something. Let me get my glass. Okay, 59.4786, all right? So the, the equation that fits it the best is Y equals 59, uh, 56, sorry, point, let's just call it 56.5 times X, all right? So that's the equation that fits it the best, but you'll notice I didn't do y equals mx plus b, I just did y equals mx. What if I throw in a b? Maybe that might uh, uh, make it a little better. Okay, so uh, let me come down here and I'm gonna say plus b. All right, ah, yeah, that looks a lot better. Okay, and now notice that I'm getting a different m value this time than I was before, okay? And I get a little B value here. So, so Desmos is saying that if I add in the plus B, then it can do a much better job. So it says that Y equals 82.1 X minus 12.8. Okay, so that fits the data much better. This is what, what's called the line of best fit. Now, in this case, you can see it's not a great fit. Um, but it's the best possible. If you're going to insist on using a line, it's the best possible. But clearly, you know, over here, they're above the line. Here, they're all below the line. Here, it's above the line again. 
So I'm thinking maybe a line is not actually the best equation to use. Now, before we talk about that, there's one other thing. I want you guys to look here. Do you see this value here that says R squared? Is that, uh, well, I'm, okay, I'm guessing your teacher probably hasn't talked to you about that yet either. R squared is an important thing that tells you at a glance, how well does the data fit? Uh, and so the way that it works is if the data fits perfectly, so I mean, if every single dot here was exactly on the line, so we have an absolute perfect fit, then R squared would be one, okay? But only if everything fits perfectly. Now, in the real world, if you're using measured data, you know, there's always going to be some measurement error. It's unavoidable. So in the real world, you'll, you're never going to get R squared to equal exactly one, but you can get it to be pretty darn close. All right, so, so using a line here, we get an R squared value of uh, 0.94. Now that's pretty close to one, but I'm thinking we can do better. All right, so now when I look at the, uh, the suggestions that you guys made, some of you thought that maybe a quadratic would fit the data better. All right, so let's see if it does. Let's hit plus, let's go into expression. And so now I want a quadratic. So I'm gonna do Y1 and I'm gonna do tilde because I have, I have a tilde on my, on my keyboard. Uh, so I can just go ahead and type it in. All right, so what's the generic formula for a quadratic? Well, it's A times X1 squared plus B times X1, oops. Let me do just, there we go, times x1, and then plus c. All right, so there's a quadratic, and you can see, you know, that does, that looks pretty good. Um, it's not perfect, you know, this one right here is a little above, um, but you know, that's not bad. What does our r squared value look like? Oh, hey, look at that. Our r squared value is, 0.9978. Ooh, I like that. I'm thinking maybe we're onto something. That is a pretty darn good fit. Okay, so then, so the equation here that looks like it's going to work for us is y equals 115 times x squared minus 10 uh, times x plus 1.0. Uh, Okay, this looks like the equation that fits it the best. But let's play around with a couple others just, uh, just for grins. Um, what if we wanted to try a cubic function? Okay, so let's, let's try a cubic function. So let's go into here and let's try y1 tilde a times x1 to the third power plus b times x1 to the second power, plus c times x1 to the first power, plus d. Okay, what do we got here? All right, so there is, that. so this blue one now is uh, the one we want. Come on, why is my annotation not working here? Okay, so the blue one now is the cubic. And let me go to blue here. Okay, all right, and then down here, oh, you just kind of can't see it very well. It's hidden by that little, like, there we go. Okay, so those are the values for A, B, C, and D down here in the bottom. Okay, the important thing that I'm interested in is, did my R squared value uh, increase appreciably by going to a cubic? And so what I see is my R squared value is 0.998, whereas over here is 0.9978. That is not enough of an increase to really make it worth going to the cubic. So I look at that and I say, well, okay, I'm gonna stick with quadratic. I'm just gonna call it a quadratic, okay? Now, what are a couple of other functions that we might theoretically have played with? Okay, there's one in particular that I want you guys to be aware of and that's the square root function. 
So let's try doing it. Let, let me clear out everything. Let, let's tell you what, let's hide these guys. Okay. All right. Let's, let's see what does the square root function look like. So I'm going to come in here. So I'm going to do y1 tilde a times the square root. Now on my keyboard, I don't have a square root function. So I'll just come in here and do it using the Desmos keyboard of x1 and then plus b. Okay. So there, oh, you can see that one's terrible. Look at my r squared. My r squared is only 0.869 on that. And just by looking at it by eyeball, I can see that's clearly not the right function for this because this one, this one starts out steep and as time goes on, it gets less steep, which is the exact opposite of what my data does. Okay, so a square root function is not going to be the right one, at least for this data. But who knows, for your data, maybe it is. All right, so you see what we do here? This is the way that I want you to analyze the data. So Aubrey, I see your question. I just haven't had a chance to respond to it yet. Don't worry, I'll get back to you later. Um, okay, so this is the way I'm gonna want you to analyze the data. Any questions about that? So uh, you're, I'm sure you're curious to know exactly how I'm gonna want you to, to submit the uh, the assignment. So let's go into uh, Canvas. Let's go into Physics. Come on. Okay, go into the modules. All right. So if I go down to here, okay. So you'll see that we've got a new module here that wasn't there before. Module number six. Uh, so let's click on the Pendulum Lab report. And so here you see what I want you guys to do. So gather the necessary materials to perform the Pendulum Lab, which we've already talked about now. So your deliverable is I want you to write up a report telling me what you did. And I want you to submit that report using the link that's here on this page. And here's the important thing. I want you to follow the rubric that's shown right here, okay? So if you, if you click on the words here, it will download the rubric so that you can print it and then I, I print, have it by your side while you write the report, which is what I recommend. But if you're lazy and you just want to view it here in Canvas, click on that, all right? And so here is the rubric. Let me enlarge it a bit here and zoom up a bit. Okay, now I gotta tell you, I, I wrote this rubric uh, a couple of years ago, back in the days before coronavirus. So a few of the things in here will not apply to you, okay? But most of it will. All right, so the first thing are the names of the members in your group listed in your lab report. Well, since you're gonna be doing it by yourself, that is not going to be something that you need to worry about. Is the purpose of the lab clearly stated in the opening sentence? Yeah, uh, make sure that you do that, okay? The, your first sentence or two should explain why you're doing the lab. All right, next sentence. How well done is the drawing showing the equipment and how it's used? So definitely, I want you to include a drawing uh, and you know, label the various different aspects and uh, you know, so we can understand how you're doing what you're doing. Um, and by the way, that reminds me something that I should have said before. Let me pause for just a second. There's, there's one other thing that some of you might do that's going to mess up your results. And so if I hold it by hand and I let it swing, I hope you realize that's a bad way to do things. Because even if I try to hold my hand as perfectly still as I can, that's just, I, it, there's going to be some variation, right? So what I hope that you'll do instead is find a table or something like that. And, okay, so, so have it right here on the table and then have it swing like that. That way, you don't, we don't need to rely on my hand being nice and steady, okay? So that make sure that you include that when you, uh, when you do your experiment there. Uh, okay, let's go back into sharing here. Okay, 
Now, uh, the next part, this is the part that will not apply to you. Um, part one of the lab, that was where, remember, I broke you up into the different groups and people studied the effect of changing the mass or changing the starting angle. Okay, so that's not going to apply to you guys. So cross that out. Everything related to part one, just cross that out. But everything else, everything else applies. Okay, so I want you to tell me what was your hypothesis for part two. Now, we already agreed that it was direct, so nothing there. But the linear versus nonlinear, I want you to, you know, those of you that thought it was going to be not, that thought it was going to be linear, go ahead and say that in your report. I'm not going to take off points for having a wrong hypothesis. Um, okay, uh, and actually tell you what, how about let's do it this way. Let's change this slightly. So you've got two possibilities. We know it's going to be nonlinear. Is it going to be nonlinear like this, where it starts off shallow and then gets steeper? Or is it going to be nonlinear like this, where it starts off steeper and gets shallower? Okay, so A or B. Okay, so I want you guys to make a hypothesis before you do the lab. Do you think it's going to be nonlinear like, like A, or do you think it's going to be nonlinear like B? And put that in your report. Okay, I want to see all the raw data. Put it in in table format. Um, I want an explanation for how did you find the relationship. I want you to tell me step by step how you did the experiment, how you analyzed the results, and what is the equation that you came up with, and how did you get that equation. Explaining how to do that is the most important part of the lab. And so this section right here is the part that I'm going to weight the most heavily when I'm trying to figure out what grade to give you. So put a big star by this one. This is the most important part of the lab report. Okay, uh, let's see what else have we got here. Okay, so a graph. Well, I definitely want you to include the graph. Now, do not just hand draw the graph. Okay, I want you to go into Desmos. Uh, let's see, oh, how do I get out of it? It looks like I have to do this in order to get out of it. Okay, do you, I, I trust you guys know that uh, the, the Desmos will let you save the graph. So if you come over here to the right, you see this little icon that says share graph. So click on that. And then there's a couple ways you could share it. You could, you could copy the link, but that's not the appropriate one in this case. You could print it out, but, but that's not really the best. Export image, that's the one I want you to do here. So if you select export image, then give it a couple seconds. Okay, there we go. So we have a couple options here and whether we do the line thick, thin or medium, but once you get it the way you like, here we go. If we download ping, okay, so it's gonna download the, uh, the image and then you can now uh, import this into your report, okay? So I want you to include the report in or I want you to include the graph in your report and, and take it right straight from Desmos into it like that. Okay, let's go back to here again. All right, so what else do I wanna see in your reports here? Um, okay, I wanna know how well does your equation match the real true equation? Now, you don't yet know what the real true, true equation is. Some of you might be tempted to look it up and find out what it is. Um, please come up with your equation first, okay? Don't, don't look it up to find out what the real equation is until after you have looked at, at your data and come up with your equation. Uh, and by the way, if you don't know where to find the quote unquote real equation, I won't mind if you don't leave that, or I won't mind if you leave that out. Um, but I know what the real equation is. And so I'm going to look to see, do your co is your equation, first of all, did you use the right form of equation? And second of all, what numbers did you come up with for the A and the B and the C and all that? And are those numbers close to what scientists have accepted as the real equation? Okay, then I want to see a conclusion. All right, every lab report you ever do, there should be a conclusion at the end, you know, just a short paragraph that just summarizes the results. Uh, and then I also like to see uh, just a sentence or two giving suggestions for how 
things might have done been done better. Think of it as advice that you might want to give to next year students so that they can avoid some mistakes that you might have made. All right. So this is a pretty standard rubric that I do for all my lab reports. Uh, and writing lab reports is, a, well, doing labs and then writing lab reports is a really important thing that you need to learn in physics. It's not just all manipulating equations and doing math. It's performing experiments, doing them in ways where you get reliable data and then reporting the results in, uh, in the proper form. Okay, any questions about what you need to do? Not seeing any, not hearing any. All right. Okay, so uh, you have 20 minutes left before the class period ends. So I'm gonna let you guys go now, but remember class is not over. Use the next 20 minutes to gather up all the materials. Oh, hey, I just thought of one thing. Don't leave just yet. One thing I, I, for, I meant to tell you and I forgot. When you're looking for the object that you want to tie on the end of the string, if you get a nice compact, relatively small object like, like the battery that I'm using here, you'll get good results. If you get an object like, for instance, you might be tempted to take an object like a wrench and have the wrench be the mass at the, at the you tie at the end of the string, you will not get results that match the quote unquote true equation uh, as well. If the object that you tie at the end of the string is an extended object like this. Uh, and the reasons for that, <clears throat> I don't wanna go into right now because I don't wanna take the time. Just Let me just tell you, remember chapter eight, we skipped chapter eight in the textbook. Well, chapter eight talked about extended objects like this. So if I have this wrench, if I want to twist the wrench and make it go back and forth like this, I have to exert a, a twisting force called a torque, which you would know about if we had studied chapter eight. But uh, so when, when this thing is swinging back and forth, not only is the mass moving, but also it's changing its shape like this. And that's gonna mess up the results. I mean, not hugely, but noticeably. Okay, so do not pick a mass that looks like this wrench where it's long and skinny. Make sure that whatever mass you pick is reasonably small, okay? Uh, and so it, it swings like that and you'll get better results that way. Okay, so with that being said, oh, I, all right, so I see a question here. Can you use a battery for the lab? Yes, that would be a great thing to use. Um, or you know anything else, just something that's compact is all I ask for. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, if you want to type buy into the chat box and head out and then get started working in the lab, you have my blessing. If you, if you had a question but you didn't want to ask because you knew it was being recorded, let me go ahead and stop the recording so that you can talk without your embarrassment. <laughs>